Good morning, everybody. Thank you for your patience. My name is Roger Green. I'm the general editor of The New Polis. I want to thank you all for being here from all around the globe. Um, especially, we want to thank uh, Walter Mignolo and Victor Taylor, um, who my colleague Carl, who's doing some of the technical stuff right now, is going to introduce in just a few minutes. I have a couple of announcements to make um, just as we get started. One is please keep uh, your mics muted um, when you're not speaking um, because of the background noise. Um, and as questions arise, you want to put them into the dialog box as they come up. We'll be taking questions in the second part of the talk, the second hour. Um, today is the one of multiple, it's our most widely attended so far critical conversations, but we have multiple ones that we've done beforehand. Um, and so just a couple of, of, of things to think about. First of all, we're always calling for more submissions um, on the new polis for writing. You do not need to be an academic to be a contributor to the new polis at all. Um, and we take general submissions or submissions, particularly right now, on issues related to decoloniality, to the doctrine of discovery, to indigenous issues. That's a particular focus that we have uh, this spring. Um, so we have today's talk. Um, on February 9th, we will have another talk with uh, Tink Tinker, um, who's Washage Osage Nation, um, and Glenn Morris, who I believe I saw in the chat earlier today, who um, is Shawnee and runs the Fourth World Center at CU Denver. Um, and they will be talking about, uh, uh, well, critiquing issues, the, the language around sovereignty for American Indians in particular on February 9th. Uh, in March, we will have Jonathan Fardy talking about his little book, um, Altuzair and Art. Um, and so we'll be asking people to maybe uh, read it because it's very short. Um, and so I wanted to, to just give a, a little picture there. And then um, uh, Walter will be back with us for a whole conference around decoloniality in April, and he will be one of our keynote speakers. And we invite you all, if you're working on these issues, to contribute to or um, uh, possibly propose something for the conference as well. There's a link that will be up on the new polis later on today uh, with more information around that. Um, and then just one last reminder here, um, if you are contributing to this, as you can see, we are recording um, right now. And uh, if, uh, um, <clears throat> if you could, uh, if you do end up participating, just know that we are recording this and that we will re-release the videos with transcripts on the website. Um, we have another transcript from last month's talk, which was with Barbara Mann, a Seneca scholar, and Tink Tinker as well on issues of native worldview. Um, and so be looking for that as well. Um, the transcript, it, it's just been the holiday, so the transcript is still coming. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my colleague, um, Dr. Carl Rashke from University of Denver, um, who will introduce Victor and Walter. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing about the recording. Uh, this is for pure formal legal reasons, uh, so don't sweat it. Uh, that if you participate in this seminar, you are by participating, you are de facto uh, allowing us to record and publish whatever you say and so forth. So if by chance you don't want that to happen, you need to unparticipate. Um, okay, uh, so. Uh, Roger mentioned the conference we're having, um, the call for presentations, we, uh, which will include not only academics, uh, but we want people who are not academics as much to be involved uh, in the presentations, in the conversations, uh, particularly community people, uh, perhaps not just locally in Denver, which is technically the um, virtual hard side of the conference, but you know, wherever. Uh, in other words, we, we want this to be both a local and a global, let's call it a global uh, conversation. So that call will be up later today or late this evening at the latest. Uh, it will be on the new polis. If you will look in the chat right now, you can see the um, uh, 
general website or the general URL for the new polis, which is the new polis.com. Uh, uh, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, our next uh, participant who is a long friend and colleague of mine. Uh, he and I have worked very closely together in running what is a nonprofit organization uh, that sponsors the New Polis and also other publications such as the Journal for Culture and Religious Theory, which has been around actually since 1999. It was one of, it was the second electronic academic uh, journal uh, to be founded then. So we're, it's, this is uh, coming up on its 21st um, anniversary right now. Um, Victor has been uh, not only a director of the Whitestone Foundation uh, since, since early on, but he is uh, uh, executive editor for the Journal of Culture Religious Theory uh, and by extension for the New Polis. What, we also have an arts publication known as thesis.org uh, or arts related arts discourse uh, publication you might say. These are all part of the family of Whitestone publications. Uh, so that, that being all said, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Victor. Uh, and again, please uh, watch for the announcement of the conference. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Carl. And uh, thank you, Roger. I uh, appreciate this opportunity. And also thank you to Walter for agreeing to uh, participate today. Um, just to sort of um, preview of what we're going to do, I have a, a PowerPoint. Uh, presentation, slide deck. And a couple of years ago, Walter and I <clears throat> did something similar at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Slot Foundation. And what we'll do is um, I have some key passages from on decoloniality and have uh, Walter sort of um, reflect on these and um, elaborate on some of the key concepts. Um, that will provide uh, participants who may not be um, very familiar with, with uh, Walter's work, a context for the conversation today. And for those of you who are very familiar with his work, um, it'll give you a kind of different insight into his sort of thinking about these uh, critical concepts. So- uh, Excuse um, me, Victor, could you just uh, give a, you know, a de facto bio of, of yeah. Walter? For those and that's what I'm gonna do, that's what <laughs> I'm gonna do now. So we'll begin with, I'll share my screen. And Roger, is that good? Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, the te so the conversation, if you can see my video, is from uh, Walter's uh, recent uh, book on decoloniality, concepts, analytics, and praxis. And so um, it's a real honor to be here today uh, with with Walter. Um, we met several years ago when he came to York College and gave a brilliant uh, talk for us. Um, actually, Carl was part of the same series that year, I believe. And so just as a, a kind of quick biography, although he doesn't need uh, much of an introduction, he's, he's widely known as a scholar. Professor Mignolo, as it says here, um, is the uh, William Hain Wanamaker Distinguished Professor of Romance Studies, and we want to include the and, and Professor of Literature at Duke University. Uh, Walter, Professor Minolo has written uh, about, uh, has, you know, almost, you know, more than 15 to 20 books, um, uh, numerous articles. Um, if you look on YouTube, there are numerous uh, interviews that he does. He's very, he's incredibly generous with his time um, with scholars. And he is also, you know, um, you know, quite sort of adept at moving the entire sort of, uh, you know, critical field forward with his insights. So, um, you know, I don't want to sort of be hyperbolic, but I think Walter is probably one of, you know, the, the most significant thinkers in decolonial studies today. And I really appreciate his work very much. And I know that um, many of you do as well. I think some of you probably know that um, what his, his book, uh, The Darker Side of the Renaissance, um, you know, is widely read uh, in the humanities and graduate seminars. Um, not to mention um, the, the, other, the sort of 
uh, related book, The Darker Side of Western Modernity. I mean, these are sort of classics in the field um, that everyone is, um, you know, has read. And then this latest book um, on decoloniality, I think is an excellent um, critical dive into the concept. And I think Walter and his, and his, and his co-author, uh, Catherine Walsh, have done sort of a wonderful job of sort of presenting uh, decoloniality in a, um, a very interesting context that looks forward. It's very forward looking. And when we were at uh, Penn and the Slot Foundation, many of the questions toward the end were really about um, Walter's work going, going forward. And, and, and the presentation will end with Walter describing his uh, forthcoming book with Duke University Press. All right, so with that, let me begin um, with uh, sort of biography too, um, Professor Mignolo Walter's research focus. And this comes from the Duke um, People page. So I'm presuming that it's entirely accurate. And if not, Walter can, uh, can correct it. But as we see here in the slide, Professor Minolo's work uh, stands on four basic premises. And for those of you who, you know, maybe not very familiar with decoloniality, it's sort of important to note these points. Um, these premises are that there is no world system before 1500 and the integration of America in the Western Christian European imaginary. B is that that world system generated from ideas of newness, the new world and of modernity and see that there is no modernity without coloniality. And I think this is a, a critical point to keep in mind uh, during the slide deck. Coloniality is constitutive, not derivative of modernity. And the modern colonial imaginary was mounted and maintained on the invention of the human and humanity that provided the point of reference for the invention of racism and sexism, sexism together with the invention of nature. So for those of you who are kind of maybe new to Professor Minolo's work, I think these, these four premises give us a kind of four corners of his scholarship to, um, as a context. So um, in Walter's um, academia.u biography, which is very brief, he describes himself as a semiotician um, and a decolonial thinker. Um, a semiotician from Argentina and a decolonial thinker from Argentina too. So, uh, <laughs> so he's both. So I think the first question is, and we talked about this, it's a very interesting sort of path, path toward um, his, his work today. But I, I'm hoping that Walter could describe how that, that history, that, bio, that, that, that path from semiotician to decolonial thinker. So Walter, maybe you can explain the trajectory of your career to this point. Well, okay, uh, it's my turn now to thank uh, all of you. I mean, Victor for kind of kicking the ball and then Carl and Roger kind of playing the game. And here we are, and all of you, all of you to, uh, to be uh, in this room, in this room from all around the world. Something that we didn't think before uh, COVID to do this kind of conversation. I love this kind of conversation more than <clears throat> lecture. So I think that this is something that uh, will, will stay with us <clears throat> if we survive uh, the crisis. So um, thank you again for everything. I want to start with a couple of uh, reference to what uh, has been said. <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. Uh, Victor, if I have a chance, if we were, <laughs> if we have kind of many days in a room, I will ask all of you, the hundred and almost 200, 199 people listening, I will ask you, what, what is coloniality and decoloniality meaning to you? because if you are here this morning, afternoon, or evening, it's not because of me, it's because, uh, it's because the concept of coloniality and decoloniality. I am one of the people <coughs> who are kind of thinking, living, teaching, writing uh, around those concepts, but it's 
the concept, uh, not uh, not the people. So the second thing I want to say, uh, just so where you listen, uh, just think about, <clears throat> and perhaps when you intervene, you may say something, what coloniality or decoloniality may mean to you, why are you kind of interested, attracted, <clears throat> Uh, or whatever, whatever feeling, uh, sensing, kind of attach you to coloniality, decoloniality. Uh, Roger and Carr have insisted on inviting non-academic. I think it's very important, and it's very important. I want to uh, stress that coloniality is not an academic concept. Coloniality. It doesn't come from uh, the Université de Paris or Heidelberg or California or University, whatever. <clears throat> it's not a university concept. It's a concept that emerged in the struggle in the field as an outcome of dependency theory um, in South America between the 60s and, um, and I would say the 80s. <clears throat> So Quijano, Aníbal Quijano, who introduced the concept, he was a sociologist, a sociologist. He was teaching at the University of San Marcos in, uh, in Lima, Peru. But his life was more outside of the university. So he was using the university to do his job <coughs> that, rather than being uh, used by the university. So coloniality, doesn't emerge, didn't emerge, and emerged in the early 90s <coughs> uh, as an academic concept. But the decolonization neither. Decolonization is not an academic concept in its inception. I don't know if somebody in the West mentioned decolonization, but that doesn't matter when decolonization really took hold, is with the struggle of the Third World for liberation. So for me, the Conference of Bandung in 1955 remained as a kind of icon of uh, whatever, whatever we can say about the specific <coughs> uh, moment, uh, intention of Sukarno, etc. But was a kind of uh, established decolonization, not, not only as a kind of orientation of the struggle, but as a way of thinking and of a way of being in the world. People thinking about the colonization, they were saying, I mean, especially, uh, I would say that the teaching that I gathered from, <clears throat> from the Bandung Conference is neither communist nor capitalist, but decolonization. And that was not the third position like uh, Giddens or Beck it's a third position that was a kind of a mixture between <coughs> liberalism and, 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 and communism. That was something else. So it was not exactly clear what decolonization meant, but basically at that point decolonization was that the native or indigenous people in Africa and Asia will build their own nation state. That when Quijano introduced the concept of decoloniality, it was very clear for everybody that the state was not the solution, it was a problem. But not a problem like for Reagan, because for Reagan the state was a the state was a problem because he wanted just the market to control everything. For decolonization, the state or the third world, the state is a problem because it's dependent on this interstate system and the, inter and the capitalist uh, system. So the question today uh, is what means decoloniality after the end of the, uh, the Cold War? So uh, <clears throat> those are the kind of the preliminary, <coughs> uh, sorry, <coughs> the pre preliminary observation. Now, going back to uh, the semiotician or the colonial thinker. Before that, I will say that the book itself, the book we wrote with Catherine, is a kind of, is a summary of 20 years of work. The, what is called the collective modernity, coloniality, decoloniality, modernity slash coloniality, 
slash decoloniality uh, was formed around 1998. So Quijano, Quijano introduced the concept in 92, but took a while until several of us who were working around colonization, coloniality, etc., didn't know each other until somebody, uh, Edgardo Lander from Venezuela, gathered us in uh, Montreal and the International Association of Sociology, and he made, he be, uh, he organized two panels, and that kind of was the the beginning. It was a beginning not planned, and that is the beauty of modernity coloniality, is that never was a a, a chair or a CEO was a group of people who kind of enjoy thinking together and whoever organized meetings in one other institution that year was the kind of organizer but was never never a, a chief uh, to put it that way so 20 years uh, 20 years of work uh, is the kind of the book uh, trying to summary it's a summary but it's also looking forward here this is where we are at this point according to uh Catherine and myself but with the collaboration with 20 25 people who are working uh, around the concept or, or perhaps more <coughs> around the concept of uh, coloniality uh, introduced uh, by by Quijano <coughs> um, so the other thing I want to say is that for us, coloniality is a concept that emerged in the Third World, in the South American Andes, <clears throat> where the indigenous population is about 60%. But it's not about indigenous, I mean, it's about the, it's about the, the, the world. Uh, so coloniality is not the talking of South American culture, because at that point it was clear that we, uh, that we cannot just let Giddens and Beck and whatever to talk about globalization, as if globalization was uh, only a concern or, or, or only people in the North Atlantic can address the question of globalization. <clears throat> so that was the moment in which uh, from Quijano on, we kind of decided to take our intellectual destiny in our own hands. So that is a kind of decolonial thinking, and decolonial thinking means thinking around the concept of coloniality. In the same way that being a Marxist thinker means to think around the capital, or from the capital on. Or being a psychoanalyst means to <coughs> think about key concepts introduced by Freud. So you cannot detach coloniality from decoloniality. Coloniality is a decolonial concept, and you cannot uh, detach the unconscious from psychoanalysis. Psycho the, the unconscious is a psychoanalytic concept, and psychoanalysis exists because of the unconscious. The same, the same here. What that means is that we are not proposing a universal theory of decoloniality or decolonization. Not at all. There are a lot of people now using the coloniality, decolonization, coloniality, decolonization in different ways. And that's good. That's good because people are realizing that all the options they have, <coughs> uh, Marxist, liberalism, uh, Catholicism, uh, Islamism, etc., <coughs> they are missing something and what they are missing is not that there are incomplete theories <laughs> kind of abstract a way of looking at it is something missing because there is something that we feel and we cannot find it in that option there is something in me that said well i mean for a long time i was looking and i i, I just started with philosophy and then literature and then semiotics and, and then marxism and then semiotics 
So I was looking for something, and, and, and the fact that I was moving through different fields is because none of them, all of them gave me something, but none of them gave me this, ah, that's it. <laughs> so uh, in that search, when I f found the concept of coloniality, that was. And I said that in a couple of books. That was a kind of epiphany. So coloniality not only put everything together rationally, put everything together in me, <laughs> connected all the kind of things, sensation, thinking, feeling that I was uh, kind of playing around, connected all of them. Didn't subsume <laughs> so, uh, as a uni universal make me understand why I was not satisfied with, I was not satisfied. So, uh, and, 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 and then by teaching and, uh, and, and giving lectures and seminar around the world, I began to understand that when people hear coloniality in, in, at that moment, the same kind of effect is produced and people who have felt the colonial, uh, coloniality before was similar. So what is interesting about coloniality is that it touches people. And the question is why? And that is not universal. Every, every human being is different and every kind of local history, national history, uh, etc., cetera, uh, as sexual, racial classification. So uh, there is not, uh, un cannot be a universal uh, uh, perspective or model. And that's why we would start, uh, start talking about pluriversality, right? Uh, <clears throat> so um, the point I was uh, driving at is that coloniality, the coloniality is a way intent, of course, the global, but not universal. Because every theory and every cosmogony aim at, <laughs> at the, <laughs> aim at the totality to eliminate the global. Be the Popol Vuh, the, uh, uh, the, the Bible, uh, the Quran, any, any kind of cos cosmogonic narrative, a kind of the, uh, the this, this story of the creation of, of the world and of the human being um, aim at the totality. But what happened to us is that since the 16th century, one totality, the was Christian totality, gained hegemony and began to kind of relegate the other totality to the past or to folklore or to uh, other kind of interesting uh, thing. But again, uh, the point here is that we are, we are not claiming that we are the owner of decoloniality. People can think decoloniality in a different way. Uh, what Catherine and I did was to say, and, and we said that in the book uh, several times, this is the way we think coloniality and decoloniality after Quijano, and that is the, that is the way we think we do, we move, we live uh, in the world. So that, uh, Victor, as a kind of introductory uh, observation before uh, going into the colonial thinker and uh, semiotician. I don't know if you want to say something or somebody will. Uh, no, I th Walter, I think that was, a, that was sort of an excellent uh, context setting. I think from the, the, the passage I pulled from on decoloniality, uh, the decoloniality denotes a way of thinking, knowing, and being, right. um, and doing uh, emphasizes that point. So um, I think you you've addressed the, the major ideas of this passage. But could you talk a little bit about your your journey from semiotician to decolonial thinker? Well, <clears throat> that is a very appropriate question because now I am I have been writing uh, about that because somebody in Argentina. A philosopher in Argentina, a woman philosopher, uh, <clears throat> kind of. Uh, we are doing an interview 
But an interview is becoming a kind of uh, short or autobiography, intellectual autobiography. <laughs> and then I have two uh, young, uh, young colleagues uh, there in the 35, 40s, who kind of started a conversation, dialogues, kind of reconstructing, not just my life, but also reconstructing an atmosphere of, let's say, the Cordoba, Argentina before I went to France, because all of that beautiful years in, in Argentina in the 60s, uh, before I went to France in uh, 60, no, I went in uh, the 60s, yeah, I went to France on the, uh, at the end of 69, 70 almost, uh, were beautiful years were kind of ruined by <laughs> Uh, on Ghana dictatorship, and that erased the memory. And what we realize is that the younger generation of Cordoba don't know about that. So we kind of start kind of. So my journey start start there. Uh, so basically, I was saying I was looking for uh, as uh, as any kind of young people, young person, <clears throat> and I have. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a professor, Luis Prieto, who, will, who was just coming to Cordoba from France. I mean, he was doing research in France. And he introduced us to uh, semiology. Um, I, 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 it was an obligatory seminar in the kind of uh, the, uh, the Facultad de, de Humanities. Uh, Facultad de Filosofía y Letras, uh, Philosophy and Literature, we call it, uh, but if it, or the humanities. Uh, so, was under the, the title of Gramática, Grammar, <laughs> but it was a course of semiology. I, so I took the seminar because it was obligatory, and I almost failed. I passed with the note of four, which was the minimum, <laughs> like a C minus. Uh, and I think that Luis, the professor, approved me because he saw that I was making an effort, but we agree that I didn't understand a thing. <laughs> so I passed, but the next year I came back as audit student <laughs> and I was hooked. So when all this kind of turmoil in, uh, in Argentina, 1966, uh, and after that, our professor who were leaving the country because they were uh, all Marxist, uh, Marxist Gramsci. Gramsci was a big kind of, uh, like it was in England at the, same, at the same time. So past and present in England, pasado and present in Argentina <coughs> were independent, but were two Gramsci, Gramsci kind of uh, uh, taking over the, the, uh, and, the, and the young people, the linking from the Communist Party. So uh, our professor who were leaving, they said, kids, finish your uh, licenciatura, your, your master, and get out of here. And at that point, I was obedient, <laughs> so I obeyed. Uh, and there was a fellowship uh, to study abroad, and I presented my, I mean, I applied, and I got it. <clears throat> and I got it, and uh, uh, I went to France. So uh, I went to France because that is, later on I began to understand what was going, what was happening to me. I went to France because I wanted to be as intelligent as Foucault or Derrida or, or, or Lacan. If I was there, well, uh, not as much, but at least close to. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and so I studied with Barth because uh, before that I had contacted Barth and uh, he was accepting a student from, <coughs> from abroad. So Bart for me was, uh, was, was the key point because uh, at that point he was already written Element de Semiologie that appeared in a uh, journal Communication that everybody was reading at that time. Uh, so he was, he was a connection with semiology in Argentina, even if Prieto was doing a different kind of semiology, but was semiology nonetheless. 
So, but then when I got to France uh, and I began to meet a, another, another South American uh, in, in Spain, I was going to Spain also. So we were Sudacas. So Sudaca was a kind of despective name for people coming from the South. Sudaca. Yeah? Um, and so I, I began to realize that not, not only that I would never be close to uh, Foucault or Derrida, it was very difficult to connect with French students of my generation. So all my friends at that point were non-French. They were coming from, uh, from India, for the, middle, uh, for the Middle East, from South America, of course, from Spain, uh, but none of them were French or Western European. And I began to kind of something click there. <laughs> because in Argentina, I am son of immigrant, so I never felt Argentina was my country. So I began to connect. What is happening to me that I feel this kind of thing? But anyhow, I just uh, postponed that and I, and I did my dissertation and my, my dissertation was uh, between, <clears throat> between semiotics, but also in France, I began to be interested in the school of Billyfield. And the school of Billyfield was a school of uh, heavy discourse analysis based on Chomsky, the Chomsky's of Cartesian linguistics and explanatory models in science. So I became interested in philosophy of science, which already had some in Argentina, but I, I put more focus on. So I was divided between the semiology, the French semiology, and the uh, analysis of the text, discourse, coherence, that was the kind of the key words uh, of Billyfield. So my thesis <laughs> was called Modèle et Poétique. So it was a model that coming from the science, and Poétique that was a kind of elaboration on Jacobson question, that kind of occupied me for many years. And Jacobson question was, what makes of a verbal, of a verbal, uh, what is it, is utterance or text, a work of art, a work of art of literature. So I work, I work there in my thesis and then I work all the 80s. I was working on this. At the same time that because I was in the United States, I became acquaint, uh, acquainted with, uh, at that point in the 70s, late 70s, was, uh, was still, I mean, now we talk about Latinx, but at, at that time it was just a Chicano, right? Chicanos and Chicanas. Right? So when I discover what Chicanos and, and Chicanas mean, but also the kind of Latinos, because the, the, the Cubans were, uh, were around, <clears throat> and those were the year of the life in the hyphen. So you see, <laughs> I discovered the hyphen, and then I connect to what happened to me, what I felt in France, uh, with all my friends were not from Europe, <laughs> or from Western Europe, and what happened in Argentina, right? So that began to kind of while I was doing work on text analysis, literary theory, discourse analysis, etc. In the early 80s, I began to work on the history, <clears throat> on the historiography of the Indies, the, the historiography of the New World. And interesting enough, uh, <laughs> I entered into that number one because I began to understand, sense, that the Chicanos were, were a, a present consequence of a, of a long history of colonization. So since I was coming from semiotic, I, I, could, I, I couldn't still study economy or, or political theory, I studied science, right? Uh, so the question I asked myself uh, in the late uh, 70s, 
Coming from this question, the Jacobsonian question, what does of a, a verbal text a work of art? I ask, what does of a verbal text a work of historiography? So I wrote a monograph, a monograph, a monograph and a long article, uh, 81, published 81 and 82, that became one of the <coughs> One of the point of renovation of colonial studies. Uh, the other was uh, the, the other was Rolena Adorno, who introduced Guaman Poma de Ayala, and Beatriz Pastor, who was in Dartmouth, who was working. So the three of us kind of introduced all all of us young at that moment <laughs> introduced a kind of change in the uh, in this in the study of colonial discourse and colonial literature and colonial discourse but uh, coming from semiotic and discourse analysis at the end of uh, of the 80 i realized that <clears throat> to talk about text i mean discourse uh, in the colonies was very short because what do we do with guaman poma de ayala what do we do with the mexican codex that kind of are images huh? So uh, at that point, I, I introduced the concept of colonial semiosis. So colonial, see, every, everybody was talking about colonial economy, colonial literature, colonial historiography, colonial politics. And I said, hey, <laughs> I have to talk about colonial semiosis. So I talk about colonial semiosis. And uh, so the, the article I start, uh, start kind of <clears throat> around, uh, but that is that was that was the path toward the darker side of Renaissance. So the darker side of Renaissance is a kind of confluence of semiotics, discourse analysis, and my early training. I mean, one of the courses, two courses that I took uh, in the licenciatura that was on uh, peninsular Hispanic literature. But in the peninsular Hispanic literature, one of the professors, <clears throat> that now I thank her very much, but at that point was also very boring, and I didn't, I didn't ask myself why. <laughs> she was doing philology. And philology was, didn't make any sense to me because we were interested in content. And philology became a fundamental tool. Uh, since I introduced uh, colonial semiosis, I, uh, and I kind of uh, began to dig into the Renaissance. So the <clears throat> the darker side of the Renaissance was written, was finished before I knew Quijano. So the the darker side of the Renaissance is a book on colonialism on colonization of languages, colonization of memory, historiography, everything I have been doing in historiographical discourse went into part uh, uh, chapter uh, three and four. <coughs> and in the late 80s, the fellowship I, uh, I, I, I get to kind of do the student, the, the, the investigation on the Renaissance uh, related to the Americas. I went to the Newberry and the John Carter Brown Library, and then I discovered the maps. And I discovered the maps, I uh, kind of connected with a lot of people who were talking about cartography and writing analysis of maps, like history of cartography. So chapter five and six are on cartography. So you see that, but it's basically a semiotic, on the one hand, a semiotic argument. But on the other hand, uh, the fundamental, what brought the idea of the book, because I was doing research, uh, writing articles, not thinking about a book. But what brought the idea of the, the book was a map 
the Susan Danforth, who was the uh, in, in charge of cartography in the John Carter Brown Library, I was looking at map. I have a big table and kind of looking about a lot of maps. And Susan comes and said, do you know the map of Matthew Ritchie? Well, I said, never heard about Matthew Ritchie. I don't know if you heard about Matthew Ritchie. <laughs> well, it, it turned out that Matthew Ritchie was the kind of put everything together without. <laughs> Matthew Ritchie was a Jesuit who in uh, 1582 or something like that, uh, late 16th century, she went, he went to like, like the Jesuits, I mean, to Japan and China. They were, the, the Jesuits were kind of <laughs> uh, trying to colonize, to, to save and convert no? more people, not just in the Americas, but also over there. <clears throat> so, and the story told by Matthew Ritchie and, and, and Susan gave me the kind of big Italian uh, book with the narrative of Ritchie and the map. Uh, according to the narrative, Matthew Ritchie invited to the Jesuit mission some of the wise men of the Ming dynasty. And she showed the map, and the map that he showed was, I don't know if uh, probably you, you've seen, Ortelius, Abraham Ortelius map, a map published in 1570, that is more or less the map we see today. Yeah, with the Atlantic the center, the Americas on the left, Europe on the right of the Atlantic, and then Asia. Yeah? So the map we see today is this kind of more stylistic development, more detailed. But the overall picture of distribution of land and water was already there in 1570. So apparently, the, uh, <laughs> the wise men of the Ming Dynasty, and you know, Chinese are very polite, no? they are not kind of uh, aggressive as a style we are used to lately. Uh, they were very polite <laughs> <coughs> and said, um, well, that is, a, I mean, this is a kind of paraphrase, a kind of, in, kind of uh, reinvention of that, I imagine them. This is a beautiful uh, image, <clears throat> but we wonder why, if China is in the center, why you put it there on the upper right margin? So the Chinese, you know, the, the, the map was the famous kind of nested rectangles. So with a kind of the dynasty in the center and then uh, each rectangle you you kind of go away from the center and might kind of less civilize the answer. You know? Well, apparently Richie uh, took the message and uh, he invited them again two weeks later. Uh, and so he draw the map that you see now in every when you go to to the east is in every every place. So he put, he put the Pacific in the center. And for a Western viewer, that is very disturbing because if you put, uh, if you put the Pacific in the center, then America appears on the right and Europe appears on the left. <laughs> but what that did for me is what the change of gaze means. So the whole kind of darker side of the Renaissance was in my career, a turn around. I began not just to keep on saying how the West looks at the other, even if things that the other are good <laughs> and are great. No, the question is how the other look at the West. And so I did that in the darker side of the Renaissance and that was crucial for me because in order to do that, I was not in, the, I mean, I was not in non-West. I mean, I coming from South America and South America is the West. It's a marginal West. Uh, 
in, in, the, in the kind of the North Atlantic uh, distribution, or Huntington, Huntington is a Latin American civilization, or Hegel, that Hegel said there is a bunch of barbarians there, kind of having civil war, uh, <laughs> and not, uh, that was be before the Civil War in the United States. So I was not in the non-West, I was in the West, but in the marginal West, in the Third World. I was coming from the Third World. So that is, after reading Ansaldúa in 87, <clears throat> border thinking began become to me the particular powerful tool. <coughs> So when I met Quijano, uh, first the concept of coloniality, and then two or three years later, him personally. So coloniality <clears throat> put everything together. Why? Because uh, I, be, I, I understood, number one, that colonization since 1500 referred to a specific historical moments or style or form of colonization, Spanish colonization, Portuguese, Dutch, French, <coughs> US, I mean, uh, UK, US. But coloniality was the logic of all those colonies. Hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Okay. All right, so again, we have to- Are we the only ones here? <laughs> Uh, Stephanie, yes. could you please, <laughs> Stephanie Hill, could you please turn off your uh, your sound? Could you please mute? Oh, coloniality, uh, <clears throat> coloniality is what put everything together. And I understood two things there. I mean, at that moment, but took a while. So that coloniality. I mean, as you said, Victor, there is no modernity without coloniality. That the, the school of thought that emerged from Quijano starts from that. That is the basic assumption. So any way of kind of uh, what we call theory or kind of uh, way of thinking uh, within a kind of frame uh, has that, right? Uh, Marx has plus value, Freud has the unconscious, etc. But modernity, coloniality is what distinguishes our school of thought from other way of talking about colonization, coloniality, and decolonization. And that, again, we are not judge, and we are not saying that those who don't think, <laughs> we are not saying you are with me or with my enemies. Uh, no, we are saying this is the way we do it, right? So I'm open yep. to uh, to the kind of dialogue. But so I think modernity, coloniality, and and then the second point, and then I let you, Victor. Excuse me, Victor. Before I go on, we've had some requests uh, from people in the chat. Uh, Walter, did you have some slides that you wanted to share with what you were just saying? Because uh, I think there was some sense that. There were some slides to need, illustrate what you were talking about. I don't know. I just got a number of requests from the chat for that. So, so okay. I have slides um, that are, you know, kind of excerpts from Walter's book that kind of track through the conversation. Walter got a little bit ahead of the, the slides, but I can send those to Roger and he can share them if, if he likes. Um, I Send them to me if you could. I can okay. share them. Yeah. Uh, only, only because I, I took the slide down you had because it was also request to take them down because they couldn't see Walter. So okay. right. when we put up slides, we need to, we we need to saying, keep it up just temporarily. Yeah. Okay. So I think at, at this point, because we do want to hear about your next project, Walter, uh, but to go back to something you said, just to, I think, um, elaborate a little bit more. And on decoloniality, you and Catherine emphasize interculturality which I think is a critical concept that you address, but also this idea of doing with, um, working with. And in the book, you talk about how you, um, well, you know, you, work, you are a professor, a prestigious professor at Duke. You also talk about how you identify as a, a militant intellectual and a pedagogue. Um, could you talk a little bit about how <clears throat> working 
you know, outside the, the confines of academia also sort of shaped your thinking as you, as you began seeing the connections uh, with uh, coloniality and then later with decoloniality? Okay, so uh, what I was, uh, I'm sorry I was uh, too abstract before, but I was telling a story. <laughs> I was telling the story of how I, I, I got into kind of yes. coloniality. Uh, so, um, but, um, so do, where do we go from here? Um, so I think I will show the slide and then showing the slide uh, will help people to kind of uh, have a better sense of, <clears throat> because this this kind of our way of thinking become a little bit com complex now with a, a lot of people working and a lot of concepts. So I will show the, the slide and then address the question of working with, but the, the okay. working with and the, the question of interculturality and which one is the other one you mentioned, Victor? I think uh, then to talk a little bit about your forthcoming book. Okay. Yeah, so if you want to show the slide, that would be great. I will start with my forthcoming book and the slide and then we address the working with and, uh, and <clears throat> So, uh, so I was saying that uh, for us, <clears throat> there are, for us, when I say us, is the, the people working after Gijano. <clears throat> there are two basic assumptions that there is no modernity without coloniality, I would say. <clears throat> and that, uh, There is another concept that Quijano introduced. He talks about coloniality of power. When he talks about coloniality, it's coloniality of power. Uh, and coloniality of power, and then he introduced the colonial pattern of power <coughs> that we translated into English as the colonial matrix of power. So was a lot of elaboration on that concept through the year, through the 20 years. So the next book, the, the introduction is a long introduction. It's about 80, I mean, 90 manuscript pages uh, in which uh, I, I try to kind of uh, explain the historical and the conceptual. I won't go into the historical here. People can uh, read the book later on. Uh, I, I will go into the uh, conceptual. So the coloniality of power is the will to power. If we can use some kind of Nietzschean <coughs> terminology. You know? Coloniality of power is what drives people not just, I mean, the colonizer, but also the governor, the, those who govern. And those who govern may be in the state, may be in the bank, may be in the corporation, <clears throat> may be in the mass media, etc. Now, those who govern are those who kind of control and manage. And control and manage, you need a will. <laughs> you have to be convinced, for whatever reason, that you are the person or your mission <clears throat> is to govern, uh, to manage. Uh, <clears throat> so coloniality of power is that kind of subjective. How that was formed, uh, I, I won't go into that, but uh, here is where we are. Well, the colonial matrix of power is the tool, the instrument that is being deployed by the drive to will to uh, that that will to uh, power that is driven by <coughs> coloniality, and both are hidden, masked by the rhetoric of modernity. So what we see is modernity. 
is prosperity, is progress, is happiness waiting for us. Uh, we will be better. Don't worry, we are doing the best. So modernity since the Renaissance is a set of discourses, images, sounds, promising a wonderful life. And that you see it today in the United States at least, but in Argentina too. In all the uh, advertising of the bank and uh, uh, <clears throat> and television, etc., you may have noticed that everybody look at credit card and smile. Look at the kind of a new uh, health insurance and smile. And they get something and they run on the beach and jump with the hair on the air and a smile. So that is the kind of the overwhelming image of happiness. But in order to have that kind of happiness, two things happen. You have to have money. So you see that, but you don't see the people who are suffering, who are, don't have health insurance, etc. And that is coloniality. So the question is how coloniality, the, how the colonial matrix of power manage to control that. So Quijano said that there are <clears throat> three axes that articulate the colonial matrix of power that you see in front of us. <clears throat> Domination slash exploitation slash conflict. Those three are not there. Right? When Maria Lugones in uh, 2003 or 4 or 5 published The Coloniality of Gender, so she introduced a complement to Quijano. So now we see that domination slash oppression conflict. So shortly, exploitation means uh, address more the question of exploitation of labor, expropriation of land, appropriation of land, etc. And oppression means oppression at large. It's not just the kind of exploitation of the proletarian uh, that uh, we inherited from Marxists, but uh, it's the oppression of basically r racial and sexual oppression. But racial oppression, not in the sense of just color of your skin, racial in the, everything has it's been racialized. The languages have been racialized, the religion have been racialized, the countries have been racialized. I mean, if you come from Pakistan, you are suspect. Uh, <clears throat> if you are, I, I, I don't know, everything is. So those are the three axes that uh, articulate the colonial matrix of power. So conflict, decoloniality is one of the way in which conflict emerged, but it's not the only one. So what happened here, for example, uh, after the, the assassination, the killing of uh, George Floyd, they were not decolonial, but that was a conflict. That is how the, the kind of the promises of modernity of, 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 of make American uh, better or just globalization with Obama <clears throat> created that kind of uh, incentivated that kind of uh, uh, conflict that emerged from exploitation and domination and then the, of that complex something emerged. So the coloniality is as we understand it <clears throat> is a way we address the question of modernity, coloniality, uh, domination, exploitation, domination, oppression. Uh, so this is trying to make sense of how the colonial matrix of power works. Somebody asked at the beginning if I could address the question of uh, Samira Amin, who introduced the word the linking in 80, <clears throat> 89 in a book that was called Oops, what happened? Uh, I, I took it down and you still want it up, I'm sorry. Um, we were just trying to, there's, there's some people can't see you when 
this is up. So if you still ah. need it, <laughs> put it right. <laughs> we can know we have to have half and a half. So Samir yeah. Amin uh, uh, introduced the concept of la déconnexion, and then was translated into English as the linking. So Samir Amin, uh, excellent, I mean, a brilliant uh, Egyptian uh, Marxist, proposed the linking from capital. At the same time, more or less, Quijano was not using the linking, he was using uh, desprendernos to extricate ourselves, but not of capitalism, but to the colonial matrix of power. So that is a big difference with Samir Amin. So I use the term the linking honoring Samir Amin, and I, 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 I acknowledge that in the book, uh, in, in the long article, the linking has translated in many languages, it was a short book. I honor and recognize uh, Samir Amin at the same time and say, well, we are talking about not just the linking from capital, because capital is one aspect of the colonial matrix of power. So we can come to the image. <laughs> ah, but I am disabled. <laughs> no, uh, here, hold on one second. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'll leave it up. Okay, now go ahead. Okay, so I, I want to be a kind of uh, go as quick as I can, so then we can have another intervention. <clears throat> so what you see there, <laughs> let me put it in way. This is the unconscious of Western civilization. To put it, uh, to use a kind of uh, <laughs> uh, pedagogical analogy. Uh, and, and, and this colonial matrix of power was not there in Greece. The, Greece, the Greek didn't invent that. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, uh, there was a different kind of ballgame. This began to emerge in the 16th century. So uh, this is not a cookie cutter that you can apply. <clears throat> this is a kind of map that kind of guides you, uh, like any kind of map. The map doesn't replace the city. When you walk through the city, you have a lot of experience, but the map kind of help you to kind of uh, walk around. <clears throat> so uh, let's, let's say, let's talk about the four domains. So those are domains. This is the level of the domains. And there are four domains. Uh, we put knowledge and understanding on top. And you can put everything there, aesthetic, philosophy, religion, science, etc. <clears throat> because knowledge is what control everything. I mean, capitalism is not just kind of exploitation of labor, transaction, etc. Uh, it's a knowledge that you have to convince people, as has been said after 2008, that there is no uh, there is no alternative. Capitalism is not perfect, but there is no alternative. So you have uh, knowledge is what kind of master the mentality of the people. That's why Tiongo was talking about decolonizing the mind uh, in uh, in eighty seven eighty six. So economy is not just transaction, material transaction. It's a knowledge built. A specific kind of knowledge built and justification around that transaction. The first narrative, master narrative, that we know about capitalism, what we call capitalism, uh, is Adam Smith. Because for the Greek economy was not a big deal. The oikos was the management of the extended family, but the Greek themselves, they didn't see very well the merchant. The merchant were kind of a lower marginal. 
So knowledge, so Adam Smith began to kind of the, the first master narrative articulating of what we call capitalism. So Marx is called I mean liberal called capitalist, Marx is called capitalist, liberal like it, Marx is don't like it, they agree that the question is capitalism. We the link from that. <laughs> and for us the problem is the colonial matrix of power. So knowledge is knowledge control governance. And so in the West, we have, well, we have Machiavelli, but Machiavelli came from Plato and, uh, and Aristotle, and then come uh, the school of Salamanca in Spain, and then come uh, Locke, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, until uh, political theory today. So there is a theory of government, of governance. Uh, there is a theory who goes together with an ethic, because Adam Smith was not an economist. He was a philosopher and a moralist. So when he talk when he talk about the wealth of nation, he, that was a kind of unfolding of the previous book that was called the theory of a theory of the sentiment. So we have we about subjectivity and what what kind of uh, this kind of economy, the wealth of nation. So governance in the past five hundred years were monarchy governance until seventeen fifty more or less, uh, eighteen hundred and then secular nation state. We have still monarchies in the Gulf, we have monarchy in Spain, in England, in Holland, but basically the nation state, and the nation state is the bourgeois form of governance, because the, the monarchy are kind of the uh, religious aristocracy of the uh, 1617 uh, until uh, <coughs> mid-18th uh, century. And then you have the economy, and the economy has, has to be detached from capitalism. But today it's like economy and capitalism are the same. No, are not the same. So in this 500 here, we have at least three types of economy. We have mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism, well, there's a lot to say about that, but I mean, mercantilism was kind of displaced, but not, <laughs> not replaced, because still we have a kind of a the trade war organization uh, was um, was replaced by uh, capitalism in the sense of industrial economy that Marx elaborated. Yeah? <coughs> uh, <coughs> and at that moment, the, the question of uh, the theological concept of governance was displaced by the liberal concept of governance. Uh, so what Marx offered was within the same principle, a change of content. So he, he offered a different kind of governance from the perspective of socialism, not from the perspective of liberalism. And then if we jump, we jump to the, the, the 20th, uh, 20th century kind of governance have changed in the sense that <clears throat> until 1970, more or less, the economy was part of society. And today, with neoliberalism, the society has become part of the economy. And that, for me, explains in part, uh, this is more complex than that, but in one a small element is that we had, we have still a, a president that is entrepreneur, that didn't come from the kind of the tradition of political uh, formation. Uh, so that is a, is a, so that's governance. So, and then economy, I, I just ex kind of explain the economy. Economy, since slavery until today, is an economy in where you have, you, you have to live to work in a different way. From a slavery, from the proletarian who has worked so many hours, in the 19th century to today. And the genius of capitalism was, and, and that is knowledge and understanding, the kind of the control and manipulation of the senses, what we call as thesis now, to convince people that it's great to be busy. I remember, I remember in the 80s, in the, in the 90s, with 
people were happy to say, oh, I, I don't have time. I am so busy. And that was a kind of pride to be busy. So to be, uh, to be ocioso is to be lazy. Oh, you are a loser. You have to be a winner. So those are kind of mechanisms of the rhetoric of modernity, how to convince you to be a happy slave. And to be a happy slave is because you can buy things, right? So happiness become equal to having. And having from, from the billionaires, but having to the middle class who buy Louis Vuitton, to the people who buy in Walmart. So there is a kind of uh, extensive map of people convinced and, and they feel good. They don't feel good if they don't get out now because they cannot consume, they cannot go to a restaurant, they cannot go, but etc. So economy, uh, what we call, I mean, capitalism is that kind of economy what manage first to force people living to work and then manage to convince people that it's go, good to live to work because you don't have better thing to do. It prevents you to think you have better thing to do. And, and technology, the technology in the sense of the, uh, of the iPod and uh, you really capture everything because uh, I see people who don't have anything to see, to do in the airplane and they have to kind of go back and forth of the iPod looking for something. So uh, technology is not just a, a way of making business, it's a way of controlling the subjectivity of the people. What do, we, what do you do now if you don't have an iPod? What? That is, uh, so, and then the other domain, the crucial domain is the, the concept of the human. The concept of the human, as we understand it today, is a Western Renaissance concept. And the concept of the human <clears throat> was created by whom? By European men who were Christians, who were white, and who, if they were not, they say they were heterosexual. So the concept of the human is a model of humanity that allows to the emergence of racism as we know it today. Racism is not a question of Babylon or Greece. Yes, so there were differences in Greece and, and Babylon in uh, the Inca, the Aztec, etc. But races as we know it today goes together with a new type of economy. It's a justification of exploitation and uh, oppression of people to serve a new form of government, a new form of kind of economy. Uh, so the human, uh, or as Sylvia Winter will put it, human men. So uh, if we follow human, uh, Sylvia Winter a little bit here, because it's very helpful, uh, I, I have been in, we have been in conversation with Sylvia, Sylvia kind of quotes us, we quote Sylvia. <clears throat> Sylvia introduced uh, new elements on the concept of races that was elaborated by Quijano <clears throat> when he said that race is a fundamental concept in the creation of the colonial mixture of power in the, in the sense of you need races to exploit because you cannot exploit an equal. You have to make people inferior. Uh, convince people that they are inferior so they obey or you are forced them. Uh, uh, to uh, to obey. So Sylvia said, "Men, human." To uh, to emphasize that the concept of human, even if the dictionary said human refer to men and women, I disagree. <laughs> uh, I mean, it mean in the dictionary, but in real life, human means men. Right? 
men human and he and she she articulate two kind of men human <clears throat> one is the men human of the renaissance related to theology related to monarchy related to all the kind of the and the men human of the enlightenment which is kind of guided by reason and we can say today that after uh, after cybernetics after uh yeah <clears throat> Yeah, after cybernetics, that kind of started the explosion of technology until artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I would say that we are in a, in a kind of men three. There is a difference. It's no longer theology, it's no longer masculinity, kind of related to reason. Those didn't go away, but now there is a new tool of kind of control and it's that kind of is related to technology in the sense of uh <clears throat> going toward uh, 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 artificial intelligence okay so this these are the four domain and and you can ask how you how do we decide that those are the far, four domains and not others uh for us this is a way to re to reconstruct what the rhetoric of modernity is telling us. We got those four domains by looking at the discourse of modernity and, and, and how they kind of control and emphasize knowledge, how they control and emphasize governance, economy, and the concept of the human. So that's a kind of, <clears throat> is looking at what modernity hides at the moment that announce. And this is what I'm going to say is crucial. We have to understand that since the 16th century through today, the constitution, transformation, etc., of the colonial matrix of power is simultaneous with the institution. So modernity is simultaneous with coloniality. The constitution is simultaneous with destitution. And this shows you the logic of coloniality in the process of destitution. Oh, I forgot one, I forgot one element. So here, there is another level, which is the level of denunciation. <clears throat> and this is what you don't see. Because knowledge, human governance, all that are, <clears throat> are, are there in the discourse, in the images, etc. But the enunciation you don't see. Uh, and the enunciation is what controls everything. And the fact that you don't see the enunciation is fundamental for Eurocentrists to have been able to convince us of universalism. Because the enunciation is not there. <laughs> so you, you announce the universal, but you don't emphasize who is using, who is announcing the universal. So what is the enunciation? I give you <clears throat> three components. Institution. <clears throat> so, the church, of course, the monarchy, uh, the university, the museums, that are kind of control of knowledge and understanding, the IMF, the World Bank, etc etc there is a bunch of institutions that uh, kind of anchor the enunciation uh, language now before that actors those institutions are kind of a dialectical relationship with actors the actors who govern those institutions are not anybody I mean we cannot apply to be 
uh, director of the IMF uh, or, or to be the next pope. So each institution has its own kind of way of controlling who will be the actor that <laughs> represents. And the last one, the most important, uh, is languages. Because all knowledge and understanding, hegemonic, is based on six European modern languages. Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese that were more prominent during the Renaissance, and it, Italy especially for the Renaissance. And then the Enlightenment, English, French, and German. And now English kind of took over. And those languages are based on Greek and Latin. All other languages are local. These are, these are local too. You see what I mean? These are local too, but it, it sounds like it's very universal. Chinese has way much more speaker than English and Spanish. But Chinese is not a language of hegemonic knowledge and understanding. We don't discuss in Chinese. We don't discuss in, 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 uh, in Urdu. We don't discuss in Hindi. We don't discuss in Aymara. Aymara do, and Hindi do too, and Chinese. But you see, the constitution of the enunciation destituted. Destituted all other form of governance, all other form of economy, uh, all other kind of languages. No? So that is the question of destitution. Wow, that is... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Sorry. What destitute is really the enunciation because it's the enunciation that has to has the power to rule out by opinion by the by scientific by scientific argument by force too, but it so happened that force always has to be justified in the rhetoric of modernity. You can kill in the name of human rights, like Clinton did in Kosovo. But you need the human rights as a rhetoric to justify what you destitute. So the, you des the things that have been destitute that are important today are the communal wisdom. Science, philosophy, theology, Christian theology, destituted communal wisdom. Uh, it destituted living in harmony and plenitude, replaced by uh, by the hierarchy, the hierarchy of society, competition uh, to do it better, to be the first, to be uh, to be uh, to be yeah, to be better, to be the first, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that living in harmony. Uh, it's not that we're perfect, but the question is that until this, the, the 16th century, there was no cultural civilization that controlled the other. So Western civilization, and it have, it have, they, they have the, 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 their own way of knowing, living, thinking, etc. Et it destitutes the commun communal economy. And, and today there is a lot of example, even even in the kind of, not even, but uh, the, the study is a kind of the uh, the economy of the gift and the economy of reciprocity, that uh, not just indigenous people, but uh, but but uh, historian of economy of Islam or not the Islam, but the kind of the Muslim Arab world, uh, are talking about a type of economy of gift and reciprocity that it has nothing to do with the kind of exploitation, accumulation, and investment of the surplus to produce more. So destituted other kind of communal economy and destituted all the lesser humans. And that is the kind of racist and sexist that the kind of uh, destituted by the concept of the human, by the concept of the human is, is knowledge. It's not, it's not that every human being said, I am human. Human is uh, it's, it's, it's a singular way of conceiving humanness 
and using that singular way to destitute uh, other human beings. And so racism and sexism are two basic tools. And finally, we are now in the coloniality. <clears throat> decoloniality is the, the movement of reconstitution, of reconstitution of the destituted that is meaningful to us today. The concept of, and, and this was what Quijano said in, uh, in 92 when he wrote the article on modernity coloniality. He said, <clears throat> understanding that taking the state was no longer a solution, he said, decolonization, and in the sense of decoloniality now, colon, epistemological reconstitution. It means that without reconstituting the way we know, and, and then we added the question of, because of oppression, the question of aesthesis, the reconstitution of knowing and sensing and emotioning. Uh, so that uh, that is in, in all the kind of the the, uh, the level the, the 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 domain in which kind of destitution, and that cannot be a model, cannot be a model because the local history of different countries in the world is different, and different people too. So to do the coloniality in India or in Pakistan or in in, in Zimbabwe or in South Africa or in Bolivia is is, is a different ballgame. And that, uh, Victor, is kind of uh, connect with the fact, the question that decoloniality is in the academia, but it's no longer limited to the academia. And that is what uh, coming to the beginning when you're inviting people, you don't have, you don't have to be academic to think. I think that that is very important to remember. <laughs> uh, and now today, probably the academician, not all, <laughs> but a, a significant number, are people who are not necessarily thinking. And Lewis Gordon, Jamaican philosopher, uh, has a wonderful essay called Disciplinary Decadence. And disciplinary decadence is when people began to fight within a discipline, to have the right without the discipline, and to say the discipline. Well, the same happened with capitalism. People are desperate to save capitalism. They don't care about human, human life or, or the life of the planet. And we saw it. We saw it here. We saw it in, in Brazil. Uh, so the, the kind of the academia, but not just academia, uh, it's a modernity accustomed to us to defend abstract universal. We defend democracy. Give me a break. People are, are dying. People are being killed in the Middle East in defense of democracy. So the question is, stop thinking about defending abstract universal. And that is the question, the big invite of decolonial delinking. But decolonial delinking is not just resistance, because if you resist, you play the game <laughs> of uh, you play the game of whoever put the rule of the game. So resistance has to be followed by re-existence. And re-existence is epistemological or nociological anesthetic reconstitution. And that is, uh, and that's my next book. So after the first chapter, the introduction that explain all that, uh, there are three or four sections and uh, chapters in which I do different kind of exercise on analyzing how modernity coloniality work and what are the kind of the, the venues, the decolonial venues that can be open. I am not the one to say this is the way. 
I even try to say, well, this is what I see and this is what I do. It's up to you now to kind of find, if you are interested in this, to find your own way to kind of delink, to extricate yourself and to work to the reconstitution of knowing and reconstitution of sensing. So the question is, as uh, Kijano said it several times, we, we need a new horizon of meaning. Because the horizon of meaning that modernity and Western civilization traces for us and for the world now is not working. So there is another dimension I did in the book, which is the, the, kind, of the kind of global geopolitics, but uh, so there are two levels. One is the, the global geopolitics, uh, which is the kind of geopolitics of knowing, sense, and believing, and the other is the corpo, uh, or the body, the body politics of knowing, sense, and believing. This is related to obsession, to uh, oppression. The other is related to exploitation, just in a kind of very schematic way. But it's a long book. Book is about uh, will be about six hundred and seventy pages. So I try to kind of see this in different instances, in different domain, but also in different kind of locales. So. Victor, uh, it's yeah. your great. Well, thank you so much, Walter. I mean, I think you you gave us a uh, incredible context for your work, and I'm looking forward to the 600 plus, almost 700 pages to read in the spring. Uh, we have some time left. I know uh, some of the participants are eager to ask some questions. I think Roger's been keeping track of those, so maybe there are a few questions that we can um, ask Walter. As, uh, can I ask a, a re request, since we have a limited amount of time left, maybe we could, if Roger's monitoring, if, if it's possible to combine the quest, some of the questions so so the different topics get addressed? Yeah. I think it's good to read several questions. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, let me start with um, Luna, or Christine uh, De La Luna, um, who asks, um, she says her question is, understanding decoloniality as an alternative theory to that of hegemon he hegemonic or macro narratives. So can you read more? So we, uh, everybody knows what is in the mind of the people. I think, well, I think Roger froze. Okay. Um, Eurocentrism. Oh, here we go. To further the disruption of colonial epistemology, epistemological. Yeah, let me start over because you froze, you went out there. Oh, sorry. Okay, let me just start from the beginning here. Uh, understanding decoloniality as an alternative theory to that of hegemon hegemonic macro narratives, Eurocentrism slash Westernism, Occidentalismo. What do you see as an existing gap to further the project of decolonial study to further the disruption of colonial epistemological ideologies and cultural expressions within the neoliberal slash capitalist global system of education. Lisa McCullough asks, under view, oh, oh sorry, that, that's just a comment. Um, uh, let me skip down. Uh, Gustavo um, Rinson wants to know, uh, is curious about uh, the lineage that you talk about um, of research concerning technology, the currency of artificial intelligence and quantum computing. What are our ethical and moral responsibilities? Rafael Sartorius says, uh, Professor Mignolo, what do you think about the BDS or uh, boycott divest sanction movement who intends to boycott Israel considering anti-Semitism and decoloniality as reference points? So can you read that, uh, the, the last one again? Sure. What do you think about the boycott divest sanction movement who intends to boycott Israel considering anti-Semitism and decoloniality as reference points. 
Oh. <clears throat> well, uh, can I have a request? We have about 15 minutes. <coughs> we have to quit. Our, but latest at 10 after, um, it'd be 10 after two, years, everybody's time on the East Coast. And okay. Okay. Back. Yeah. Yeah. We got started a little late. So that sounds right to me. Um, I'll just ask one or two more and then I'll let you just uh, fill up the rest of the time, Walter and Victor. Um, uh, uh, so uh, Rehab Hassan asks, uh, can decoloniality be applied to narrative theory? Decoloniality can be applied to what? Merit? Narrative theory. Huh. And uh, Dora um, Rebelo says, where does the unlearning that is needed for decolonial thinking fit into your four level scheme? Uh, I'm going to pause there. There are a couple more and I'll just direct Walter and Victor to, to the questions in the chat. There's one from Kieran, um, but I'll, I'll let you um, go with, with the ones that I've just asked for now. Yeah, maybe we can focus uh, on unlearning because so that's so we have to finish at two or since we start later, we can go 10 minutes later. We can we can go 10 minutes later for sure. Yeah. Okay. So I, I try to be as short as possible. <laughs> uh, alternative. We don't talk about, uh, uh, about alternative. We talk about option. And that changes the way we think about. I mean, Escobar has a, a a very good expression several years ago uh, when he talked about alternative two, alternative two capitalism. There was a bunch of people. But uh, I, I talk about option and what I mean by option. We live among options. So religions are options. Ideologies, in the same system of ideas, liberalism, Marxism, uh, etc., uh, <clears throat> there are options, secular options, and disciplines are options. We live among options. We we live among narratives, <laughs> kind of uh, convince us. Modernity convince us the kind of the quantum mechanics kind of represent the world. No, it's a narrative. Quantum mechanic is like the Popol Vuh or, uh, or the Bible, the kind of one way to narrate. So to talk about options uh, means two things, that there is nothing but options. And decoloniality is an option that didn't exist until recently. So we are introducing that option among the existing options. So it's alternative to every option, <laughs> right? Uh, it's not alternative, it's something else. Because we don't want to replace or we want to do something, something else. Uh, so that is one thing, that they kind of reconfigure reality in the sense that it appears a different kind of narrative. It's a kind of pluriverse of narratives. And the second is that uh, decoloniality is an option, not a mission. That we are not trying to convert people to decoloniality like the Christian trying to convert or, or the Marxist or the liberal or the neoliberal. Uh, it's an option that is there and whoever sees as uh, beneficial or whatever just take and run with it. It's, we are not writing a sacred text. We are not kind of writing a model. We are just living, thinking, writing, and that is kind of open up the conversation, right? Uh, we don't talk about the colonial studies. We talk about the colonial thinking. Because the colonial studies, like alternative, keeps you within the frame of mind of modernity. <clears throat> you have a field of studies and then you have a method. Those of you who are in the PhD uh, period at this time uh, probably are used to uh, the question, what is your method? If somebody asks me what is my method, I fail 
I don't know what my made of it. It's the way. Because, I mean, if you have a problem, you think and you find a way. But but it, it's a joke, but this is serious that, that people, <laughs> people, somebody who will say, uh, I got a fellowship and I have a method. Now what I'm going to study? <laughs> you have a method, but... So the question is, what is your problem? What is your question? And the problem and the, the question for us emerge from coloniality and then kind of generate decolonial thinking. So how it touch to education? Well, in two ways. Uh, you cannot decolonize the curriculum, you cannot decolonize the university at this point. It's like decolonizing the state. Forget it. But you can do decolonial work at the university or at the museum or any other institution. But also, education is not limited to the university or the institution of education. Education is conversation that can happen in every place. And we can use the university for that, but we can do it in a different setting. And many of us, Catherine, myself, many other people. So we have to distinguish education from schooling. What university and a school, a school does is a school people not educate. Educate is conversation. It's conversation where people exchange and learn from each other. So in relation to education, the, uh, the, the colonial studies and education, these are the things that we are discussing now. And, and Catherine have a long experience on this. So when she talk about the colonial education or the, the colonial pedagogy, she comes from Paulo Freire, and then kind of she met Quijano, or the coloniality. So this is a huge thing, but uh, we have to kind of open up, cross the concept of studies. I can say more of that, but I don't have time. Uh, we don't talk about philosophical studies, even philosophy is a discipline. Philosophy is a way of thinking. So the colonial thinking, uh, the, the colonial is a way of thinking and living in the world. So philosophy doesn't have either the kind of the property right of thinking. Philosophy is the way that the Greek decided to call what they were doing in thinking. And that's fine. But that destituted in Western civilization other way of thinking. So people, even African or Latin American, began to think, do we have a Latin American philosophy? Do we have an African philosophy? As if having philosophy was something to have. So the liberation of thinking is that they colonize education, they colonize schooling to liberate education and to liberate thinking. Where do we do it? Well, it depends on uh, all of us, whatever we are. Uh, and learning. <laughs> That's a great question. The, the levels, the four domains and the enunciation, that is the process of unlearning. We are unlearning modernity by kind of revealing how coloniality works. Unlearning is to begin to... The, the postmodern said we don't need more macro history. And we say, well, sorry. Of your kind, no. <laughs> but we need macro history because you erase our macro history. <laughs> so, coloniality in that sense, the colonial matter of power, is a pattern of not global history, macro narrative. But the macro narrative, absolutely necessary to unlearn the narrative of Christianity, to unlearn the narrative of Hegel, to unlearn the narrative of Marx, and to unlearn the narrative of Freud, Lacan, etc., without denying their contribution. And that is the point. Modernity thinks that the new supersedes all the rest. No, we disagree. That is why an option. So we have to think about coexistence. So that 
psychoanalysis and postmodernity and, li and neoliberalism and decoloniality, they coexist. And I think that the, the, the one of the questions uh, in relation to lib uh, liberalism and all that, uh, I didn't. <clears throat> I think it's very important uh, to think about what we can do. And what we can do is what we are. I don't think at this moment we can imagine that we can take the state and uh, kind of transform that the state in the decolonial state. That's impossible. It was possible to have the, the, the Iranian revolution or the uh, Cuban revolution, but at this point uh, there is a lot of, on the one hand, there is a lot of problem because of the uh, the harassment of, of the United States. But there's a lot of constitution because the very concept of nation states. The nation state care for the national, they don't care for the human. And that is why we have the problem of immigrants and refugees and all these kind of things. Uh, so the question there is what we can do, what we are. I think we have to be modest. Uh, now we are living in, in, in a world where the United States has 800 military bases around the world. Trillions, trillions of dollars are circulating in the kind of armament, but also in the uh, corporation, banks, finances, technology. What can we do? Well, we can, uh, we can take the example of Stacey Harris. Stacey Harris, huh? The, the leader of Georgia, the, the, the Stacey leader. Abrams. Eh? Stacey oh, Abrams. Yeah. Stacey Abrams. Well, she has, that is fantastic what she did. But she has a north. <laughs> she has an orientation. We have to get all these people of color in Georgia to become aware of what is going on and to vote for the Democrats. It's not that the Democrats are a solution, but uh, at, the same, at, at, at the same time, uh, is, is a way of preventing uh, the extreme right to go forward. So and Stacey, uh, Stacey Abrams did it in Georgia as a black woman because there is where she could do something. So that's what we have to, to uh, there, is no, there is no answer to Lenin question, what to do. Well, what to do depends on uh, each of us. Where are we and what we are ready to fight for? Being aware that neoliberalism, I mean, being aware that the, 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 the planet is controlled by, by the economy of exploitation, but also being aware that the West cannot control capitalism anymore. So that is something I don't see much discussed in the West, but is much discussed in the East. Capitalism is global, but it escaped the hands of liberalism and neoliberalism. China is capitalist, if you wish, but it's not neoliberal. Neither is Russia, neither is Iran. Why not? <laughs> Because neoliberalism is not just capitalism. The global design of neoliberalism is to homogenize the world, right? And that, that, that was clear since, uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that is what failed. Capitalism succeed globally, but the world cannot be homogenized anymore according to the West. So the West has to kind of learn uh, to be modest, to learn that that is fine, but this is not the universal model that everybody wants and die to think. And lately, less and less, right? So, uh, and the question, of, uh, the question of Israel, I think that uh, somebody said in the East, 
<coughs> Kishore Mahbubani, I don't know if you're familiar with the name, Kishore Mahbubani was the ambassador of Singapore in the United Nations uh, in the 90s, and then, uh, and then he went back to Singapore and created the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. He's a very tremendous intellectual. Uh, I mean, not the colonial, but it's a tremendous the Western uh, intellectual. But he, he was saying that this, uh, in 2007, 2008, the most dangerous country for global peace today is United States. And we are seeing this every year. And that, I think, is the question of, of, of Israel. I think that uh, the recent kind of agreement between Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates and Trump uh, <clears throat> was a clear maneuver uh, to kind of being able to control the Middle East, which is becoming more and more difficult because of Turkey, because of Iran, but because Russia and China, and mainly China that has a lot of interest in Syria, not political interest, economic interest for the Belt and Road Initiative. So I think that what we see in, 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 uh, in the Middle East, there are two things. One is the desperate move of the United States to control the interstate system. And the second is that people are not talking too much. Uh, I don't know what. Uh, why? But this is the kind of the powerful alliance between uh, between Israel and and United States, which was incentivated because of Kushner. But Biden may be more moderate. But Biden said many years ago to be Zionist, not to it doesn't you don't have to be Zionist. You don't have to be Jew. But. And that is the question, a history of Zionism, that uh, the secular Zionist. But now the Jews are kind of, if you are anti-Zionist, you anti-Jew. No, I am anti-Zionist. And I have a lot of Jews, the colonial uh, Jews friends who work with Palestinians. So Judaism doesn't equal Israel. And that was uh, one of these. So apply, apply to narrative. Oh boy, uh, <laughs> this is the one. I will give a talk in Toronto on Friday about this. Uh, <clears throat> you don't apply the colonial. That is a modern thing, and that is one of the one of the things that happened to postcolonial. That postcolonial became a theory to be applied. Not that not that Baba or or Spivak were doing that, but the postcolonial <laughs> began to kind of. And this is another difference between postcolonial and decolonial. The postcolonial is an academic discipline or uh, field of uh, inquiries, I don't know what. But the decolonial emerged outside of the academia and then entered into the academia. So you don't apply. It. So what you can do is briefly the following. When Freud, or not when Freud, but any psychoanalyst is in front of somebody who is being asked to be analyzed, the analyse, uh, as the French would say, what is the psychoanalyst doing? He's doing two things. He's listening to that narrative because there are not two people equal. <laughs> Each person is different and every narrative is singular. So each narrative, 100, 200, 1,000, is all different narrative. But the psychoanalyst is doing two things there. He's listening to the narrative, but he's also thinking about how, what the unconscious is telling me about this narrative. And vice versa, what this narrative is telling me about the unconscious. So what we do about narrative, and I will do with two examples of two narrative from South Africa that they call uh, non-fictional literature, uh, Jabulo Ndebele and Angie Kroc. Uh, he's black, she's white, African. What I do in is this, is what these two narrative 
is telling me about the colonial makes of power and what the colonial makes of power helped me to understand this narrative. You see, the strategy is totally different because when you apply, you remain in the surface of the narrative and you interpret the meaning, etc., 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 the conflict of interpretation that we have, etc., etc. We are changing the geography of reasoning. And that is one of many examples that is difficult to understand because we have been schooled. <laughs> we have been schooled in body and soul <laughs> to think otherwise, to think, to think in, in the modern way, to think it, we have a theory and we have the application. No, thinking and writing and doing is praxis. And what kind of praxis? The most basic praxis we can think about, which is the praxis of living. To live, we have to work, and that is beautiful. But living to work, that is not. That is a slavery. So the question is, we have to regain the beauty, or as a uh, uh, communitarian or co communitarian feminist uh, in Guatemala, like Lorena Capnal, if there are some people here from, from South America, brilliant thinker, and of course she is not in the university, brilliant thinker and doer, and she said, I am recover my joy without losing my indignation. And I think that this, the Caribbean are saying this, the same thing. The question is to recover the joy of living and thinking because neoliberalists don't want us to do that. Neoliberalists want us not to think, and that is why the, the kind of iPod, not have time to think and energy because we have to work. So that kind of the linking is the linking ourselves. And it's only by the linking ourselves that we can do something. Because you cannot decolonize if you are a modern subject.